I've lived in a village in Leicestershire for the last 30 years, and in all seven general elections during that time, I have never been canvassed by literally anyone. Why? Because I live in a safe seat where the same party always wins with a large majority. At the last election, 22,000. If I lived a few hundred yards further north on the other side of the constituency boundary, the seat there has changed hands twice during that time. That's where everyone focuses their attention because it can make a difference. Simply put, the votes there are more valuable. We need to end this mother of all postcode lotteries and change the system to one where all votes have the same value. I'm going to answer briefly the question about the, making the link between PR and climate crisis in the media and I think more broadly with the public. Um, I think it's really about having an unstoppable grassroots movement, which is of course what, what, what we work to create and you're all part of. We're going to be having a massive lobby on the 24th of May, so it's my turn for the shameless plug. Um, so we'll be going to Parliament en masse and lobbying our MP, so do come along and help make that link. Um, if you care about the climate crisis, make that, that, that link clear to your MP. Welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, can you all hear me all right? Great. <laughs> um, so this is very exciting and we're a bit nervous. This is the biggest event Make Votes Matter has <laughs> organised to date. And that's largely because it's not just Make Votes Matter that's been organising it. Um, we've been working with lots of allies across the democracy sector to um, make this and the lobby on the 24th of, the May, of May uh, as big as possible. So we've had almost a thousand signups to this event um, and we're hoping we'll get a similar number at least or even more to sort the system on the 24th of May in, par uh, in Parliament um, in Westminster. Um, and uh, just to make a quick note, we are recording this. Um, if you're not happy to be recorded, please turn, turn your camera off, but do stay with us if possible. Um, so. As a movement of hundreds of thousands of democracy advocates and dozens of organizations and parties pushing for PR, we've made incredible progress over the past eight years. All of the opposition parties now have official policy for PR. Um, unfortunately, the leadership of the largest opposition party still needs a little bit more convincing. Um, so that's kind of what this is about, as part of what this is about. Um, they'll only be convinced when it's blindingly clear that real democracy is an issue the general public cares about and, and will consider when they vote. So we need to make this a doorstep demand and we need to make Sort the System the largest ever lobby for PR. Um, and that's why it's so exciting. So many of you cho have chosen to invest your time in this event tonight. Um, just to introduce myself and Make Votes Matter, I'm Klein, Kleiner Jordan. I'm a chief executive at Make Votes Matter. We've got lots of uh, lots of other lovely team members on the call here, and we've got people representing various other democracy organisations who will be introducing shortly. We've also got a few parliamentarians who are going to uh, make the case for PR and why this big lobby needs to happen now. Um, so uh, we've got a lot to get through tonight. Um, we, we would prefer generally to have audience participation, but because we've got so many hundreds of people attending, um, we're, we're not having the live chat. And uh, at the point where we're inviting you to ask questions of the panel, that's actually gonna be via a form, which we'll share the link to, um, and the team will be uh, finding the questions and, and sharing them for the, the chairs to ask to the panelists. Um, obviously, there will be opportunities to participate in person at uh, Sort the System, so we very much encourage you to actually come along to that and you can interact fully on the day. There will also be some other uh, events prior to that, um, so there's going to be a few briefing events which will be on Zoom as well, where it will be much more participative. Um, so far, we've got almost one and a half thousand people signed up to sort the system. Um, and so one of the main things we need to achieve tonight is making sure that um, many come on the day. Um, 
so we've got an action session where everyone will be uh, taking the next step on the ladder to make sure that uh, they, they, they've they got their MP ready to talk to them and that they come to Westminster. We've got hundreds of people from all regions of the UK who've now contacted their MP. We also have people from as far as Holton Price and Howden, West Worcestershire, Carmarthen West and South Pembrokeshire, Tiverton and Hoddington, South End West, Norwich, all over the place, committing to come on the day. Um, and we hope that you will all be coming on the day and bringing friends and family too. So we're now going to hear from MPs and uh, parliamentarians about just uh, from just a few of the parties that will be represented on the 24th of May. So here are some amazing allies. We have um, Stephen Kinnock, who is Labour MP for Aberavon since 2015. We have Tommy Shepherd, Scottish National Party MP for Edinburgh East since 2015. And Zach Polanski, who's Deputy Leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, a uh, London-wide member of the London Assembly since 2021. So without any further ado, I would like to pass over to our speakers, um, starting with Stephen. You each have three minutes to make the case for why we need to do this now and get people energised, ready to come to the event. Well, thank you so much, Kleiner, and um, congratulations on organising this huge Zoom event. And uh, I'm also hugely looking forward to the event on the 24th of May. I'm speaking to you all from the so-called cradle of democracy here in Westminster, but we know that it is not the cradle of democracy. We do not elect people to this place on the basis of a democratic system. First past the post is not democratic. Uh, we know the reasons why, worth a very quick recap, um, simply because all votes must be equal. I think as a, a colleague said in, on the video, in, in uh, just to introduce this session, um, it's the, the mother of all postcode lotteries and votes matter so much more in some constituencies than others, that simply cannot be right. Every vote should count equally. Uh, secondly, seats must reflect votes. It's completely unacceptable that we have that disparity between uh, the actual percentage of the public vote that you get and then you can end up getting far more uh, seats in Parliament. Think about as well the, the actual real world impact. There's very clear evidence uh, based on research that um, countries that have proportional systems have greater income equality, less corporate control, better long term planning and political stability, fairer representation of women and minorities, higher voter turnout and better environmental laws. So this is about real world impacts. This isn't just something uh, for people who've got a particular fascination with voting systems, this really matters in terms of outcomes. Um, tactical voting, it's completely wrong that people should have to hold their noses and vote for parties that they don't actually uh, support. Uh, and I think that there's something around the political culture. I think we're living in an increasingly uh, polarized political system and first past the post um, absolutely stokes that division uh, and, and polarization. Uh, and the final point I would make, I guess, is this idea that first past the post delivers stable government. Are you kidding me? Look at the complete and utter shambles and mess uh, that we have had in our political system, uh, certainly since 2015, 2016. Uh, and it, it's not democratic, it's deeply unstable. Um, and of course, people also say, well, it keeps extremist parties out of uh, out of politics. I have to say, I think what happens in some political parties is you get infiltration and you get extremists actually running the show uh, from within the larger political party. So the case is absolutely clear. I was delighted that Labour Party conference last year voted overwhelmingly in favour of the pro PR motion, but there's still a long way to go uh, to make sure that we get this as a commitment uh, going forward as our, as our party and as our in our manifesto going into the next general election. And I'm uh, greatly looking forward to being part of the campaign, greatly looking forward to working with Making Vote, Make Votes Matter and to joining you uh, on the 24th of May uh, for the big pro PR jamboree. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, great to be working with all of you. And I look forward to do so going forward. Thank you so much, Stephen. That's fantastic. Um, right. We're going to swiftly pass over to Tommy Shepherd now. Um, if you could spotlight, please, Poppy. Thanks, Kleiner. Um, 
I, so I speak as the uh, constitutional affairs spokesperson of the Scottish National Party here uh, at Westminster, uh, and I am delighted to pledge our party support for Make Votes Matter and for the campaign for PR, and we will be supporting the lobby on the 24th of May. Um, and I say that despite the, the, in the opening video, your, um, your initial contributor from, I think it was Castle Douglas, uh, made the quite valid point that actually in Scotland, uh, the disparity between votes and representation is extremely pronounced at the moment, uh, and 55% of the population do not vote for the SNP in Scotland, only 45% do, and yet we have 80% of the seats in this parliament. So uh, I'm quite happy to be a Turkey arguing, arguing for an early Christmas. I would volunteer voluntarily give up my seat tomorrow if in return people were to say that the parliament would be comprised of parties who are sit uh, who, who have seats in proportion to the votes that they receive at the election. I think the reasons for doing that um, uh, are pretty obvious. Uh, on, on the one hand, it's just fair. It's the right thing to do. Uh, and it is absolutely appalling that we have a system where, you know, uh, where, where people are not represented and where the views of the electorate are not represented. It's just manifestly unfair. It also alienates people from the process of democracy and leads to disillusion and despair and people feeling that the democratic system isn't for them and it leads to a lack of engagement which is a problem for for our, for, for all of us who value having a democratic society uh, but the most important thing and i think that's why this campaign and this lobby has got it absolutely right in terms of the slogan is that the broken first past the post electoral system also leads to broken government and broken policies. And if we are able to fix the electoral system and get better a better system of representation of popular opinion in parliament, then I'm sure what will follow are better policies as a result. I don't think that Brexit would have happened in the manner in which it has if we had have had PR in parliament and we would have got a much a uh, closer and more civil relationship with the European Union than we have. I don't think the mini budget of last autumn, where a small right wing faction of the Tory party took the economy for a joyride, could have happened if we had a balanced parliament uh, under PR. So actually, it's not just about fixing the electoral system. It's about fixing the whole manner in which we govern ourselves and how the country is governed. And as a result, of improving that democratic structure, I think we will get better social and economic results uh, as, as an outcome. And therefore, it's vital just to conclude that we don't see PR or constitutional reform as something that is an abstract discussion separate from the bread and butter issues of the cost of living and electric bills and everything else. It is absolutely linked to it. These are two sides of the same coin, the manner in which we are governed and the outcome of that government. So that's why change has never been more necessary. And now with, with you know, with perhaps a window on the horizon in the next 18 months or so, uh, looking likely that, you know, odds on there will be a change of government. We, I think, have got fresh hope. We should be doubling down now with our opposition party commitments uh, to make sure that if the Tories don't get returned to government, uh, then there will be a reforming government which is committed to fair votes and to electoral reform. And I can assure you, although of course, my long-term objective is for Scotland to be an independent self-governing country and part of the, the European Union, for as long as we are in this place, the votes of the SNP will be delivered for electoral reform and for fair votes. Brilliant, thank you so much, Tommy. I really appreciate that. And okay, finally for this section, last but not least, Zach Polanski, welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much for having me. This is amazing to see hundreds of people choosing to spend their evening talking about democracy and listening about democracy. And I think we should take a moment to see how much that's changed. There was a while where this was considered a very niche issue or something that only people who are very into policy talked about. And actually, although there's not tens of thousands of people here, we know millions of people around this country feels like politics isn't working for them. They feel like they're not represented or they say that all politicians are the same. 
Now, we know this isn't true. Too often, this is symptomatic of a broken system. Now, I was elected as deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales less than a year ago. And in that time, I've spent a lot of time talking about how there's no environmental justice without social, racial and economic justice, too. Very brief, briefly, what does that mean? That means that as well as talking about the environment front and centre, we always need to talk about workers' rights and the importance of solidarity on the picket line. We need to talk about an NHS that isn't privatised and we need a positive story about refugees and migrants. Now, you might say to me, what's this got to do with democracy? Well, until we have a democratic system that represents these views, these views will often get lost in the political conversation. Now, it might be those aren't your views and that's fine. There's other parties out there too. But I imagine everyone on this call and the public would agree that people who have a diversity of opinions about things that matter in this way should be represented and should be part of that national conversation. Now, the other speakers have demonstrated brilliantly why we need PR. So I'm going to skip to the very final point, I think, which is why join the lobby on May the 24th. Well, as an elected representative, I can tell you there is nothing more powerful than another human being stood right in front of you, looking you in the eyes and telling you why their argument is valid. Now, I'm not talking about anger. I'm not talking about fire, although those things are valid in other situations. But sometimes just having the legitimacy of a debate and uh, of an argument and turning up with the entitlement of that. And I don't mean entitlement in a negative way. I mean it understanding that you are entitled to have a fair and free vote and being able to look someone in the eye and tell them that you're not able to vote for who you want to or you've had to make tactical decisions in the past is a politics that should be confined to history. And any politician who hears that, we do have evidence of a last lobby where we changed MPs' minds and we can do that again in bigger numbers. And finally, I would say this, if you know you have an MP who's never going to listen on proportional representation, they're never going to even turn up, I would say still turn up just for you knowing that you turned up, you stood up and you were counted will have an effect on them. They know, they'll know there were people in the lobby waiting for them. It will give morale to other activists and other members who are out there too. And also, quite frankly, when the history books are written and we talk about how we move from first past the post to proportional representation, you'll know you are part of that movement. So I'll see you on May 24th and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Brilliant. Thank you, Zach. And that's making me thinking, think that maybe we should do some empty seat photos for those MPs who aren't actually attending the meetings of their constituents on the day. OK, right. We are now on to the best bit of this meeting, which is the action session. We, we like taking action that make folks matter. So first of all, um, in a kind of a small act of embodying our intentions around this lobby, um, we'd like to invite you to put your hands up, your physical hands up to say if you're going to be coming on the day on the 24th of May. Put your hand up and leave it up for a little while so we can kind of scroll through everybody and like look at all of your lovely faces saying, I'm coming and I'm going to make my voice heard. I want real democracy and I want equal votes. Um, so let's get rid of the spotlight so we can all see each other and let's all take a moment to see everybody saying that they're coming. How wonderful. That's fantastic. Let's all absorb that for a moment for all these people okay um i'm now going to invite andy to talk us through the practical next steps thank you for that everyone thank you well that's uh given me a boost for the next bit okay um uh, i'm andy i'm going to talk a little bit about the practicalities um so i'm going to share my screen in order to do this and I'm going to show you uh, a totally different slide, which is this. There you go. Uh, and this is our, our website. Um, you've already taken the first step because you've already signed up for this evening, which means you've signed up for Sort System, um, which is fantastic. Um, we're asking you to take a few more steps now. So uh, Zach has, has set this up beautifully because he's, he's really emphasised the need for everyone to get to um, Westminster on the 24th of May. So the next steps are for you to, to write to your MP and to chase them, um, then to give us an update uh, and to let us know how you're getting along and whether or not they've replied to you. And then uh, we'd like 
invite you to book your travel if you if you need to book it in in advance and then when you've done all of that please text a friend invite them to join us on the day because the most important step is to be there uh, whether MPs have agreed to meet or not so I thought I'd take just a moment to talk you through and walk you through using the website for this so sort the system uh, you can find it very easily just googling sort the system this is the the main website and you can see that if you haven't you would have done this already you would have signed up um, and hopefully you'll let us know that you'll be there um, the next bit that we're asking you to do is to contact your MP so if you click meet your MP it will take you to the meet your MP section uh, we're asking again if you can commit to say that you'll be there and this is important because it gives us an idea of numbers we really need to know how many people are really committing to be there on the day so please do let us know as soon as you've made that commitment and um, we will then use that information um, so I will put my name in and I will put my email address in and I will put an address in and it's not going to be my address because I don't want to give that away in a huge zoom um, but it will be a particular postcode and then if I click yes opt in to email updates that will really help if you do that and if you put your phone number there that will really help as well our phone bankers are, are phoning every day to, to chase people and check that they're still coming um, and to, to help out and then it's so simple as this you, you click start writing oh I need my last name there you go it does check that as well start writing and you'll see uh, the letter has already been written for the MP for that area and uh, it's asking to join uh, to to get in touch and arrange a meeting between 1.30 and 5.30 in those rooms. Uh, you can change that if you need to. If I was to click send, which I'm not going to do because I'm not uh, going to send that to Rishi Sunak just yet, um, then it would prompt me to join the WhatsApp group as well. And we're asking everyone to join the WhatsApp group um, to let us know uh, that you're coming and to also uh, meet with other people and, and make arrangements. Um, the next thing that we're asking you to do then is just to scroll to the bottom of the website and give us an update. Really important if you can give us an update. If you can tell us that you're coming, that's fantastic. Um, if, you've, if you can tell us that you've asked your MP for a meeting, even if they've not replied, click that and then update your lobby progress. Okay, if you've arranged a meeting, fantastic if you can tell us when don't worry if you don't know where but the time if you tell us that then we can let other constituents know we can email them we can call them let them know the meeting is in progress and can they join it if they're too busy um, well we're asking you to come on the day anyway but please let us know what your MPs views are and if they replied but they didn't mention a meeting again let us know but you could also badger them you could get in touch with them you could use the website to look for their number and phone them we're asking you to use your own email as well if uh, if they don't respond to our website use your own personal email address uh, or your email account to get in touch with the, the MP as well okay so um, yeah hopefully that tool has been used by hundreds of people so far the more of us that can use it this evening the better and if you're able to do that now that would be fantastic as well try and do it before the end of the evening if you haven't already Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. And uh, just so everyone knows, Andy is the mastermind. He's making this whole thing happen. So um, basically, we've got these next steps and we would encourage you to take a few moments right now to take the next step that you haven't yet taken. So we're going to have somebody posting into the chat the relevant links. If you haven't yet written to your MP, please click on the link that's going to be in the chat in just a second and write to your MP. If you have written to your MP and you haven't given us an update, please click on the link to give us, uh, give us an update that's going to go into the chat. Um, we're not going to ask you to put your tra travel right now because it might take a bit of time and you might get a bit distracted for the rest of the meeting. But if you've written to your MP and you've given us an update, um, then maybe you could text a friend or a family member to invite them to, to join us on the day. Uh, the most important thing is to actually be there. And um, so we want as, as many people to come as possible. Just checking the chat. Thank you, Poppy. That's fantastic. Um, so there's your contact your MP, there's your update us, um, and we've got just a few moments now for everyone to take that next step. That would be incredibly helpful. And just check how we're doing for time whilst that's happening. Um, we're okay for time. 
give it a few more moments. Um, then what we're going to do is pass over to Laura Parker from Labour for a New Democracy. And Labour for a New Democracy um, have been a key driving force, the, the leading force in getting the Labour Party to have conference policy for proportional representation. So they've done amazing work these last years um, with a, a big coalition of allies um, and you know, many, many, many activists and volunteers um, taking action, getting their constituency Labour party, parties to pass motions for PR. Um, I'm just saying a little bit about this whilst everyone's taking their action um, and shortly we will be passing to Laura to chair a, a lovely panel um, of people uh, from the democracy sector representing a whole range of organisations who Laura will introduce. Um, I'm just talking a little bit more to make sure you're all taking your actions. <laughs> and then I think as soon as you're ready, Laura, we can we can start on the next bit and you can all finish emailing your MPs as you go. So I think let's pass over now, if that's all right. Hi. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me out there? <laughs> so I have a terrible feeling that I'm incredibly badly organised. It's a good job I'm not running this uh, <laughs> parliamentary lobby, but it's amazing that you've got such fantastic numbers. Um, I'm can't see, I'm afraid, because I'm not technically very competent, the people who I'm introducing. Um, I, how do I find you all at the top of my screen? Oh, and now the office alarm has gone off as well. It's all fun and games over here. Um, so I'm going to rely on the lovely Andy to prompt me with the names of people in the chat. Um, and whilst I'm getting the lovely Andy to do that, I'm going to give you two words of update about um, Labour for a New Democracy and indeed the campaign in the Labour Party, with thanks to Kleiner for the introduction. The good news is there's lots of good news. As Kleiner said, we've made massive progress in the last couple of years. There are now 60% of constituency Labour parties have got policy in favour of PR. That doesn't mean that the other 40% are opposed. On the contrary, it just means that most of them haven't yet discussed it. In 96% of constituency Labour parties, when they've debated PR, they've voted for it. So this is the absolutely overwhelming and unequivocal position of the party membership. As Kleiner said, that was reconfirmed at Labour Party conference, where in fact, two years in a row, the membership have managed to put PR on the conference agenda, which is in itself quite an achievement, and two years in a row have voted for it, which was followed then last year by the trade unions, and in a minute, um, I'll be delighted to introduce Nancy Platt from Politics for the Many, who's going to talk about that. So the Labour Party membership is unequivocal in its support. YouGov polling finds that 83% of Labour members also want electoral reform. And our ask is very simple, that the next Labour government should introduce PR in its first term. So we're in really good spirits. And what's really important for us about this lobby is that this is sort of the moment when the inside labor world which is you know through our own democratic processes engaging with the party and persuading them to adopt this policy is met by the demand of the outside world so whether you're a labor party member a green party member an SNP member a lib dem or plied apologies anyone i missed or in no party at all um, it's really important that you come and give courage to members of parliament from across the political spectrum that this is something that we ordinary folk out there whichever party we're in or no party north south east west um, that, that we want and you know it's going to be so important for us to show the labor party that its membership is in tune with the general public so that's a little bit of a canter through where we are in labor and obviously i'm happy to answer any questions um, we've got a brilliant panel now of Nancy Platts from Politics for the Many, Tom Brake uh, from Unlock Democracy, Jess Garland, Dr. Jess Garland um, from the Electoral Reform Society, uh, Sarah Lewis, who is somewhere out there from the Lib Dems for Electoral Reform, and Lena from Compass. And if I have missed anyone, I apologize. I'm not sure what order you're all going in. Um, why don't we put the trade unions first on the grounds that if the trade unions had not voted for PR overwhelmingly as they did, 
then in fact, the Labour Party would not be changing its position. So I think we'll start with you, Nancy. Okay, so do you want me just to do a little bit of, little bit of intro about you know, why this matters to trade unionists and so on? Um, great. Okay, um, so I mean, trade unions obviously are all about trying to improve life for working people, creating a more equal society and sharing wealth. They are interested in economic, in, um, economic equality, um, but we can't achieve economic equality whilst we have a voting system that favours as an anti-trade union Tory government. And if you look at the laws on trade in, um, regarding trade unions, Britain is frequently described as one of the most restrictive in the Western world, and trade union rights have constantly been attacked by every Tory government that has got into power. Uh, and one of the issues with the first past the post system is that even if you get just over the line and you get another Labour government in, no matter how much work they do to improve trade union rights and to improve the lot of working people, that is very quickly undone as soon as another Tory government gets back in. So you end up with this kind of seesaw of trade union rights, this sort of tug of war, people going backwards and forwards. And, and what we see is every time the Tories get in, they will very quickly bring in new anti-trade anti union legislation and make life even harder for the trade unions. And it's been no exception this time around. If you look at any EU country which has got embedded trade union rights, they have a high trade union density, good collective bargaining coverage. They're all democracies which employ PR electoral systems. So that's the, that's the case that we took to the trade unions. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is if you're looking at the representation on, and the makeup of Parliament, so a few stats, I won't give you too many. Of the 2019 parliamentary intake, 29% of MPs have been educated privately compared to about 7% of the population. And of the 173 MPs who went to independent schools, 11 went to Eton and only just over half of MPs went to a comprehensive school compared to about 88% of the population. So you can see that the balance, the makeup of parliament under first past the post is not reflecting working people. Um, as Laura said, um, we have had quite a lot of success in taking this to the, to the trade union movement. Um, their initial reaction was this is, this is not an issue, that is the top of our members agenda, we're very focused on industrial issues. So for us, we've had to make the case and make the case and make that link between how a PR system of voting would benefit working people. Um, and before we know it, we start to get more and more unions on board. We've got ASLEF, the Bakers Union, the Fire Brigades Union, the Musicians Union, PCS, Prospect, TSSA, UCU, Unite, and most recently Unison. So the largest trade union came on board. Um, and that is thanks to all of the democracy organisations coming together and forming this huge coalition where we worked, we worked smarter, not harder, if you like. We got together and we started to address all of the arguments. We went to the conferences to meet people. Um, we got people on our side and we got people within the trade union movement creating that upward pressure that the general secretaries and executive committees said they needed to see to be convinced that this was really a trade union issue. And what we now need is just to keep growing that as a mass movement like we've got here today. We need huge vocal support to ensure it becomes a manifesto commitment and that the Labour Party, born out of the trade union movement, can ensure that workers are always represented and always have a seat at the table. So that's my pitch. Thank you very much. I think we'll vote for you. That's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, panellists, I'm glad you're all winging it and going with the flexible nature of this session <laughs> basically we thought it'd be really great to have different perspectives from people who are all working for the same aim but bringing their different coalitions of support and their expertise to the party so in a minute i'm going to ask sarah to talk a bit about um, the world viewed from the lib dems who i hope have been given courage by the progress in the labor party but before that i just ask tom um, to spend a couple of minutes obviously unlock democracy has a broad agenda of democratic reform and I think it's really important that when discussions about democratic reform are taking place, particularly in the Labour Party, 
but also elsewhere, um, we don't let PR fall off that agenda. Like we know it's integral to the changes that we want to see. And Unlock Democracy has been working um, also at a sort of senior political level, trying to change hearts and minds in the, in the Labour Party and elsewhere. Um, but Tom, over to you. Thank you, Laura. So yes, uh, Unlock Democracy, we're working with uh, Compass, so Lena's on this call as well. Uh, we're working on a programme of democratic reforms that is wider than just PR, because the changes we want to see, PR is a good start, but isn't sufficient uh, in terms of the changes we want to see. Uh, and uh, the, the focus of this is on all the political parties, of course, in terms of trying to get them to include these changes in their manifestos. But realistically, most of our focus is on the Labour Party. Uh, the Lib Dems and the Greens, uh, to a great extent, are on board for the proposal. So it's the, the, the Labour Party that we're seeking to influence. We are also, of course, working with the Conservatives, but it's much harder to find supporters for the sorts of democratic reforms that we want to see uh, in the Conservative Party. One thing I'd like to uh, underline about sort the system is the way in which this is a, a fantastic partnership of organisations. We unlock democracy, and I suspect the other organisations on this call are often uh, contacted by members saying, "Well, why don't you work together on issues?" Well, sort the system is a very good example where everyone is working together, so we're not duplicating effort; we're actually adding uh, to each other's contribution. I just like to say briefly about the, the, the lobby and why it's important that people attend. Now, I'm, I'm going to temporarily put my former Lib Dem MP hat on, and I can tell you that there are, there are a couple of things that people recognise, or a couple of ways in which lobbies can have an impact. Scale is part of it, and I remember very clearly the, the Jubilee debt campaign, which had people snaking around from about St Thomas's Hospital along the embankment, across Lambeth Bridge, and then into Parliament. So you, members of Parliament will remember the scale of something. So if we get a, a person along from each of the constituencies, that I think is something that MPs will recognise. But they also, as Zach Polanski said earlier, they recognise the personal contact. MPs are lobbied by constituents on thousands of things each year, but the person who takes the trouble to come to visit them particularly if they've come from a long way, it may be that that MP has had a visit from a constituent, perhaps the only time that anyone has come from their constituency that is three or 400 miles away. So I'd encourage everyone to not only register, but to come to the lobby because you can make a really big difference. So that was slightly off piste in terms of what you asked me to speak about, Laura, but I thought it was worth making that point. Thank you. No, you were much more on peace than I was. And um, in, in a breakout of plurality and collaboration, I just want to agree with Tom, former Lib Dem, and Tommy from the SNP, and of course, Stephen Kinnock um, from the party I happen to be in, but most of all with Zach. I think it's really important that we turn up and we claim our rights as citizens. And if you've got a totally cloth-eared member of parliament who doesn't want to listen, you've got every much as right you know, as right to your view that your vote should count as someone who happens to have an MP, you know, who, who's got Stephen Kinnock, for example. So I think it's really important that people turn up, even if your MPs um, don't respond to your polite invitation, because also, as Tom has just said, scale, scale is so critical. And as we run up to a general election, it is the scale um, and the enthusiasm and public demand which will make our political parties um, pay attention to us. Now we know there's of the many political parties who long ago reached the sensible conclusion that the electoral system should change and who are sitting around waiting for the Labour Party to make its mind up. One of them is of course the Lib Dems. So it's really brilliant that we've got Sarah Lewis here from the Lib Dems for electoral reform to tell us what to tell Lib Dem MPs as well perhaps. Thank you, Laura. And yes, for the uninitiated, LDER stands for Liberal Democrats for Electoral Reform. Um, so as Liberal Democrats, we are deeply committed to electoral reform. We continue to be deeply committed to electoral reform and to doing what it takes to get PR after the next general election. Um, what does that mean for us when we are so deeply committed to electoral reform? Well, three things. Number one, 
it means that we are focused on getting pro PR MPs elected at the next general election, as many as possible. The second thing is putting pressure on our friends in the Labour Party so that they really do make it happen um, on the back of that, that great vote um, at Labour conference last year. And the third thing is to keep it up inside the Liberal Democrats. We need to continue to make proportional representation central to the Lib Dem agenda in the lead up to the general election and also in whatever scenario emerges after that public vote. So what does this May the 24th thing mean for us? Well, it is a very important milestone in the campaign. And in some ways, it's sort of the first milestone in what is a huge, huge push. It's going to need to be a huge push. It's a collective statement of intent. It's a battle cry, if you like. And it's really crucial that we make our cry heard on the 24th of May. Um, what are we doing as Lib Dems? Well, we will turn out in our numbers to make our views known as constituents to Conservative and Labour Party MPs. And I just want to add on to the voices of my colleagues who've talked about what to do if your MP is completely against PR and say, if your MP is completely for PR, as all of ours are, then please also show up for the lobby because your voice will count and, um, and be heard as part of the overall rallying effort. We will also be ensuring that we have a really visible presence for our own Lib Dem parliamentary party to make sure that our position is clear. And we're encouraging our young Liberals to join us. The young Liberals are going to rally. Um, obviously, this issue has been a long held policy for our party, but it's also a priority for our younger members. And we know that young people across the broader electorate are very supportive of this. So the young Liberals are rallying and we hope that the youth wings of all, all of your organisations will also make themselves known. And the final thing I wanted to say is just that I talked about Sort the System on May the 24th being the beginning. It's really important that we keep up the activity um, from here on out. This is the Kickstarter for all of our campaigning. And that means more campaigning to get more pro PR MPs elected. It means keeping up the pressure on our own local MPs and particularly Labour Party candidates who are standing at the next general election. It means building a bigger tent of voices who can show that they there is public demand, there is a public mandate for change. And for us as Liberal Democrats, it means keeping PR at the top of that agenda within our own party. So just to say as close, um, obviously at Liberal Democrats for Electoral Reform, we're really happy to be counted among the number of this group of cross-party allied organisations. And we'll be mobilising on the 24th of May. Um, we'll keep it up until we have achieved PR. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so there are lots of reasons to be cheerful, not least that all of these people are here. Um, but there is also, I think, increasing evidence that the public are really with us. And so I'm really pleased that we've got Jess Garland, who I hope, whatever else she was planning on saying, is going to give us a bit of an insight <laughs> into what's going on with public opinion. And this is really important. What, whatever sort of stripe of, of MP you're talking to, nothing appeals. I think Tom will agree to an MP as much as knowing that the public agree with them. Um, so it's great to have the evidence as well. So Jess, over to well, you. Let me magic up some of that evidence and, and, and the good news story as well, um, because you're absolutely right. And I think the big, the really big change that we're seeing in public opinion, certainly over the last um, decade, but m more importantly in the last few years, is that we no longer need to persuade people of the problem. People see the problem, it's right in front of their eyes, they feel it, they, they, they know that something's wrong in politics. And when we talk to people about it, the way they describe politics is dysfunctional, it's chaotic, it's broken, it's, people go as far as say it's corrupt, you know, and so we're not in a position of having to persuade people that change is necessary. Um, they feel it every day. And, and whilst there is still that tendency to blame politicians you know it's this political class that's the problem actually a lot of people also readily see that the system is part of the problem and, and a really big part of the problem as well so yes we are kind of still in this sort of swimming in all this populism and anti-politics mood but there is a there is a new mood as well as well which is coming up and saying actually the system is the problem the system needs to change and it's that change bit that is is really important because of course when you ask people do you like the idea of fair votes do you like pr 
you nearly always get a, a majority in favour, but we, what we saw last year with the British Social Attitude Survey was for the first time, people actually want change at Westminster. So they're not just in favour of PR in theory or on paper, they're in favour of changing Westminster in reality. And that is a big shift. That's the first time we've had a majority in favour of that view since this question was first asked in 1987, and it's been asked regularly ever since. And so that is huge for us. That means that, you know, if you turn up to the lobby, you're actually representing a majority view. This isn't just a niche interest. This is something that the public are behind you on. And that's so important because what this all adds up to is that people do not feel that the status quo is acceptable. And in fact, you know, we don't see anyone coming out and defending the status quo. No one's saying actually, you know, this first past post system is really delivering us strong and stable government and a, a really good value for everyone, as Stephen pointed out earlier on. So it is a really important moment. There has some, been some real sort of generational shifts in people's attitudes towards PR and change at Westminster. And so this lobby is representing not just the views of the people on this Zoom call, um, but actually the majority view of the British public. People are really, really desperate for change. And that is coming through in all the polling we've been doing, um, you know, over the last few years. So I think that's a really, it really is an important moment. And this, this lobby is coming right at that time. I'll stop there. Brilliant, thank you. And I recommend to everyone um, all of the work that ERS has done. Um, there's reams of it, in fact. <laughs> and, and so last but not least, um, I, I think it's really great that we've got Compass here. Uh, Compass has had a long standing commitment to proportional representation. And as many of you will know, is also a cross party organization whose members come from pretty much all parties and, and indeed some from none at all. And they're working out there um, campaigning. And so Lena, what's the view like from Compass land? Um, I think to start, um, it's always lovely to speak after all the people that are on this panel and myself just repeating everything. Um, but one of Compass's founding principles is that working towards you know a good society where we can all thrive and people can fulfill their potential is that that future is negotiated and not imposed, is that that involves everybody, as you say, that we're on the ground involving people and getting people that help define and shape that. Um, and democracy is a key part of that and democratic reform is a key part of that. It cannot happen without that. Um, but that change will not and cannot come from the great and good setting in, um, as Stephen referred to it, as a cradle of our democracy. We're trying to wrestle power away from a system and from people who want to hold on to it. We're trying to change, fundamentally change, how power works in the sixth richest country in the world. That's a huge undertaking and it's not going to come on come from on high. It's going to come from you and the people in the Zoom room. It's going to come from all the work that the brilliant other campaigners and organizations on this call and that have spoken are doing. It's going to come from talking to people on their doorsteps, bringing them along to May 24th and talking about power and making that connection between our archaic rotten voting system to why our politics isn't working for people anymore um, and I think just to pick up on that point again from Jess people know our politics doesn't work for them I'm sure we could all reel off fact after fact that proves people are just deeply disillusioned and um, that proves first past the post drives a system that doesn't represent people doesn't hear voices stifles democracy and that disempowers the vast majority of voters but I don't know if we really need those facts right now. I think we need to point out that, you know, our, there are people in this country that can't afford to feed themselves and our planet's on fire and our politics is obviously failing to rise to those challenges. This is the moment to talk about democracy um, in relation to every other issue that's going on. Um, and I think really reset the conversation to say politics can work for people, but not until we change our voting system and not until we unlock that potential there. So that's the challenge to use campaigners in May at the lobby is to make that case to your MP to show up, um, but also every day until then to be making that link between people, how disempowered people feel um, and how disconnected Westminster seems from everything and how PR could break that open. So I'll see you all in May. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to yeah, talking to my MP. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so in a remarkable, I mean, who'd have thought that we could be this organised, but we are actually on time. Um, the team from MVM have been scrolling through dozens and dozens of questions. And so Kleiner is just going to give us three questions. And then I'm going to ask our panel to pick one or 
one or two of them each. And it's going to be fun for you guys because I'm just going to seize upon you in a random order. Kleiner. <laughs> Okie dokie, we've got lots of questions. Um, I'm going to be slightly cheeky and ask a, answer a question that's aimed at, at Make Votes Matter and then give the three, uh, three other questions. So this always comes up. Does Make Votes Matter have a preferred form of PR? And it's a very quick answer, no. What we have is the Good Systems Agreement, which was released in 2019, which is a national accord by all of the pro-PR parties and organisations and politicians and public about what good voting systems look like. You can find out all about it on our website and maybe somebody could pop the, the link into the, the chat. Um, but it basically sets out the 10 principles of good voting systems, including proportionality, because all of the evidence is that the proportionality is not only correlated with better outcomes, social, environmental, economic, etc. But actually, there's a lot of political scientists that think that that's a causal factor. The proportionality is a causal factor in those better outcomes. So I'm now going to do what I'm meant to be doing and ask the three questions for Laura to chair the, the panel. So I'm um, going to start off with another classic one. What is the best, most succinct way to rebut the argument about losing the constituency link with your MP? That's from Dale Rapley. Um, so all about the constituency link. Then we've got a tricky one. As the Tory party has the most to lose from PR, what are arguments can one use to persuade a Tory MP to back PR? Um, and that's from Dawn Renfrew. And then we've got from Pat Hodgson, my MP has declined to meet me on the 24th of May and repeated his support for first past the post, which he has expressed to me in earlier correspondence. What will I actually do in the mass lobby? That might be one for Andy, I suppose. So those are the th first three questions. Oh, you're on mute. I muted myself there. Um, I think I'm going to rather unfairly ask Tom Brake if he'd like to take on the arguments for Conservative MPs, because you must have met a few in the tea room in your time, whilst the rest of you decide what question you would like to answer. <laughs> Tom, any insights on persuading Conservative MPs? Well, uh, thank you for the, the <laughs> hospital pass question. I think it's... <laughs> I think probably we have to wait until the result of the next general election, where if some of the polling is correct, the Conservatives will find first past the post working very, very strongly against them. And there maybe some of them will, will change their minds, but perhaps more, uh, more, a more appropriate response might be to highlight to Conservative members of Parliament that there are other parts of the United Kingdom, like Scotland, for instance, where PR has played a major role in ensuring that the Scottish Conservatives are very well represented in the Scottish Parliament. Had the Scottish Parliament been using a first-past-the-post system, then one would expect the result to have been pretty similar to what happened in, in the Westminster election with the SNP getting a very, very large and comfortable majority. So we can point to other parts of the United Kingdom where actually the Conservatives have very uh, directly benefited from uh, forms of PR, whether they are in uh, Scotland, Wales. Uh, uh, so those are two very concrete local examples and also which can be used to uh, to dispel the notion that PR is something that uh, that other countries do and we don't. Well, we do. Uh, we do it in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and we do it for the London Assembly. Thank you, Tom. That was brilliant. Hospital pass or not. Um, Jess, do you want to say something about the constituency link? I know this is an issue you've also looked at a lot in ERS. Sure, and it does come up a lot. Um, and I think just the, the easiest way to, to think about this is that when we think about the major PR systems used in the UK already, they have a constituency link. So when we're thinking about what forms of PR are we most familiar with in this country, those forms of PR have a constituency link as, as part of the system. So, so there's not an immediate um, direct relationship between PR systems and not having any constituency link. It's only a few systems that would, would do that. So um, that's how I see it. Familiar systems, familiar constituency link. 
Brilliant, thank you. And I know pointing with Labour MPs, pointing to systems that we not only have in the UK, but that were introduced under a Labour government does tend to also help them focus a little. Sarah, um, you want to have a, some thoughts on the Conservatives? Just building on Tom's point, I mean, I think um, the it's, it's an electoral jeopardy, right, that will make the Conservative Party move. Um, and um, yes, we've got the kind of wait until after the general election results, but we've also got this, we've got our lobby on the 24th of May. So I think there might be two things that you could say to the Conservatives um, in May. The first is look at local government where you've got monopoly Labour councils and the Tories can't get a foot in the door. Um, actually, we're in a weird situation at the moment where you have some areas where there's a kind of monopoly Labour council at local level and a Tory MP. And those Tory MPs are having to navigate that system. So they know what it feels like to not have that foot in the door from a proportional system at local government level. And we know that local government proportional representation is working perfectly well in other parts of the country. Um, the second thing I would say is that the Tories are really worried about young people, um, lack of young people supporting them and what they need to do to kind of adjust in order to be relevant. I think this is where the kind of youth voice comes in really strongly to, to show, I mean, to, to Jess's point about the public research, actually, this is not a niche issue. There is a groundswell of support for proportional representation. And by the way, younger voters are really into it. So if you're looking at pivoting so that you've got a pipeline of voters for the future, you're going to need to get on board. That's brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. And Andy, do you want to talk to those who've got MPs who don't want to meet them? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, this is a, a question that we get quite a lot. And I, I actually assume that my MP wouldn't want to speak to me, but um, I, I uh, sent my letter straight away, obviously, and they, they replied and I was surprised I've got a meeting. So it's, it's definitely worth trying, even if you think your MP won't be interested. But for those whose MPs are adamant that they're not going to meet, um, I would urge you to come on the 24th anyway. Um, we are going to be running uh, the green slip system. So um, the green slip, you, you go to Parliament, you request to, to meet an MP, even if they've said that they can't make it, and we can use that system to fill in the, the details to, to kind of name and shame them. Um, that's what we're going to be doing on the day for anybody that doesn't have an MP that's agreed to meet. Um, we'll want you to photograph that and share it online and tag it with sort the system so that we can link it all together. Um, and obviously we want you to also take part in this historic event. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what to expect later on, but you, you won't want to look back in regret that you weren't there. Um, so, yeah, make, make sure you come regardless of that. I would just urge as many people as possible to come along. That's brilliant. Thank you. Kleiner, do you want to give us any more questions? I know that Tom has had to escape, but the rest of our panel is bravely sticking it out. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of running close to time. We could do a really quick fire round. Um, we've got from Simon Steele, could student unions be part of the solution in informing voters about better alternatives? Um, that's maybe one for Nancy. Um, sorry, I'm jumping in with the chairing there. <laughs> um, and um, Various people have asked logistical questions. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to answer all of these, but maybe some of them for Andy. Does the Emmanuel Centre have safe bicycle parking? Are there train strikes? Um, and then we've got another one about uh, if people are hoping to travel down to London, they'd like to find out if others from that area are, are attending and how do they do that? Brilliant. Well, why don't we just have some thoughts from Nancy about student unions and then maybe Andy can pick up the and well, anyone else who's still young enough to be a student, feel free to opine. Um, and then maybe Andy will pass to you for the logistics. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. That's a great question. And um, we haven't attempted to mobilise the student union movement yet as politics for the many. Um, our focus has been on the uh, unions that have been affiliated to the Labour Party in, in order to get across the line at Labour Party conference. But if you have contacts in student unions, um, I would love to have them. And it would be great, actually, to add them into the politics for the many campaign and for them to become part of the mix, because um, I think they would be absolutely amazing at helping us create this upward pressure that the trade unions say they want to see. And obviously, the trade unions, um, a bit like all the political parties, very much want um, young people to join their parties and to rejuvenate them. 
Um, so what better way to try and convince people to say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll join your political party if you start thinking seriously about having a system of proportional representation where my vote will actually count no matter where I live. That will be great. Thank you. Andy, over to you now, I think. Remind me what those logistical questions were. So, safe bike parking at the Emmanuel Centre, train strikes, and are there ways of people knowing who is coming from the same region that they're coming down to London, or up to London from? Or oh, across? great. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll answer the, the, the last one first. Um, yes, we're, we are going to try to connect people up. So if you let us know if you've got an appointment with your MP, um, we will be emailing out uh, to let everyone else know that that appointment is happening. And uh, in that way, there will be coordination. There is also coordination in the form of the WhatsApp group, which I urge you all to join if you haven't already. Um, you should have been prompted to join it on uh, signing up for this evening. Um, but if you weren't, then uh, writing to your MP, um, you'll get a prompt to join the WhatsApp group there. And there are, there are scores of people in there at the moment already uh, calling out to say, I'm coming from Coventry. Is anyone else going to come along with me? So it's a really good... Uh, resource. Um, I, I'm frantically googling bike uh, facilities around the Emmanuel Centre. I'm going to have to get back to people on that. But if you've got uh, specific concerns like that, then please do let me know. Um, uh, I can't find any immediately, but there are certainly lampposts. And uh, um, I'm sure that we're talking about central London here. So I'm sure that there'll be facilities someplace. I understand that there are no train strikes planned as of yet. So um, cross fingers for that. But I yeah, make it there. Well, thank you so much um, for hosting all of us, the Lib Dems, the Greens, uh, Compass, Electoral Reform Society, all of the trade unions, which is millions of people, as represented by Nancy um, and Labour for New Democracy. We're really glad to have been here. And over to you, Kleiner. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you to all the panellists. That's fantastic. And now we're going back to Andy for more of the logistics, the what and the how, and the journey of the lobbyist, please. Okay, so once again, this hopefully will answer a bunch of questions that, that uh, people may still have. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to share my screen to show off this, uh, this website that's been put together uh, a little bit more uh, because the website has got a section on it called plan for the day and if you click on plan for the day that that gives you everything that you should need uh, to find out about what's happening uh, first of all put it on your calendar remind yourself get it into the calendar so that you you're uh, continuously reminded that you're going to be going on the 24th uh, we're prompting you again to book your travel as soon as possible and again to let us know once you have so um, if you've if you've booked your travel scroll down let us know that you've booked it that i'm all set um there's a handy map on the website to show you where we'll be meeting and the the arrival time we're asking everyone to get to london for 12 o'clock so the emmanuel center is uh not far from victoria station which is where coaches will pull, pull into uh, it's right around the corner from st james's park and it's a eight minute walk from westminster so um, if I show you the Emmanuel Center, the Emmanuel Center itself is a huge venue, uh, capacity of 900. And if I take you through the front door, you can go to the website and do a virtual tour. Um, there will be stewards to greet you on arrival when you come into the Emmanuel Center. Uh, we will be waiting here with leaflets and with uh, charts and the, uh, uh, our stewards will register you. There's screens there to let you know what's going on uh, with upcoming meeting times. And then you make your way up the stairs. I'm not going to take you all the way in there, uh, but I will go straight to the auditorium. So you'll be uh, ushered to a particular part of the auditorium that will be relevant for you. Uh, and there's disabled access, by the way, is on Tufton Street, ironically, right, right around the back of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Emmanuel Centre. And you'll come through these doors if you have, uh, 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 if, uh, uh, if you need access from the back. And then there'll be uh, speeches. We'll, we'll have uh, inspirational speeches and briefings on the morning because we're, we, it's going to be really important that people feel confident to talk to their MPs. So we will give you everything you need to know uh, to provide that information for you in advance. So we're meeting at 12 o'clock and 
then the program begins at 12.30. So we'll have uh, those briefings and those speeches from 12.30 to 1.30. Uh, PMQs will be happening at that time, so there won't be any meetings. So while they're in there, we'll be in the Emmanuel Center. Um, and at least one MP has said that they're going to try to drop in by the end to come to speak to us as well. Uh, and then from 1.30 to 5.30, there'll be meetings. And most of them are going to be taking place in rooms W1 to W3, which is just to the right-hand side inside Westminster Hall. Uh, and we'll be using the Emmanuel Center, the WhatsApp group that I mentioned earlier, and our volunteer stewards to ensure that you know where to go at each stage. Um, and those with a meeting can make the eight-minute walk or the three-minute taxi ride for anyone with mobility issues to Westminster, where we'll have stewards to greet you. Um, those that don't yet have a meeting can remain at the Emmanuel Centre for more speeches or to link up with other lobbyists or to get a coffee from the cafe below or a nearby cafe. We'll be in central London after all. And as I mentioned before, so for those whose MPs won't meet, we'll try to help you get in touch with them uh, to give them one last chance because, you know, when they see the event, there may be some peer pressure. They may change their mind at the last minute. If they still want me, we'll ask you. We'll be asking you to go to Parliament to request that green slip, um, which is, as I say, a way to sort of name and shame and uh, that MP and put it on social media, uh, and use that as a way of demonstrating how our system needs to be sorted. Uh, at some point in the day, uh, we will be gathering on Parliament Square for a photo opportunity. Again, more details will come on the day about that, and. Uh, Really importantly, during MP meetings, and this is an answer to some some questions that I've had in the past. Um, if you're planning to bring anything like banners or things with slogans, unfortunately, they can't be taken into the parliamentary estate. So um, they they should be allowed to be stayed at the Emmanuel Centre. So as long as you are able to pick it up at the end, um, you should be able to store them there while you're having your meeting, and then you can come back and collect them at the end uh, for the photo op. Um, Security is going to be high on the day because it's a PMQ's day, but yes, the reason uh, the reason why no slogans are allowed in. Um, and then finally, after after all of that, uh, there'll be some drinks. We're planning to have some sort of a drink session from 5.30, more to be or, uh, announced on the day. Um, and we will, of course, be providing more information in emails before the event and in the form of a more detailed program on the day. And to prepare for the day, you might like to attend, and we'd encourage you to attend, one of our online briefings, which um, I'm asking for somebody to put in the chat now. We've got three dates planned on the 2nd of May, the 10th of May, and the 19th of May. And you can sign up to those this evening, if you like, uh, from 6.30 on each, each evening. And these will be uh, an opportunity for you to find out in more depth how, uh, how to talk to your MP, uh, or to link up with other people in the chat, um, but also to, to uh, we'll also email about this as well so we, we um, you can you can link up with other people in those meetings we will email you about these meetings as well and um, yeah if you haven't already joined the whatsapp group as I said please do so as soon as you can I think there will be a link in the chat about that as well so there it is lovely I'm seeing the chat right now okay I'll just look forward to seeing as many people on the 24th as possible thank you everyone to all you do to win equal votes Together we will make this happen and we sure need it to happen soon. The time is now. Thanks, good night.